Welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, this is the professional development panel where we're going to be talking to some challenge grant winners from 2019. And the title of the panel is Collaborating and Learning as a Pitt Educator. Uh, my name is Effie McLaughlin. I am an assistant university dean for research at the City University of New York. And um, my entry point into the, the Pitt UN uh, movement conversation, which I'm going to ask all of our, um, our speakers, our panelists today, is mostly from a professional development, faculty development, sort of research development perspective. I'm really interested in faculty engaging with these ideas and also developing research projects around these ideas. So I hope we'll get a, a, a bit of a chance to talk more about that. Um, and also, <laughs> as David Gustin started us out with yesterday on a personal note, my greatest technological challenge, my grand challenge today was getting, I have, I live in New York City and I have three daughters who are in the New York City public school system who are all go to different schools and all have different, um, uh, they all have different online and remote learning schedules. And, and, and was, my biggest challenge today was getting them out of the house so I could have uninterrupted bandwidth time to conduct this panel in. So um, I know that some of our um, panelists today or some of the moderators today, um, you know, basically read out the bios from each one of the speakers, but I'm actually really much more interested the, the way that I would like to start out. And I'm going to introduce each one of you in turn, but I'm basically just going to say your name and your affiliation. And what I'd really like you to say is, um, you know, say whatever you think is important about your professional experience that brought you to uh, the Pitt UN meeting today. And then also because probably not a lot of the attendees today had an opportunity to view your, your poster session video. So if you could give really just a very brief um, statement about what your project was, and I'm going to try to keep this short. I already had a conversation with Mahmoud about this, but we're going to try to stick to the time as much as we can. So please try to keep it at, at two minutes and I will, uh, if I have to break you in for time, I guess I will. But I, so I'm gonna start out with, I'm just gonna go in the order that they were on the, um, in the program. So I'm gonna start out with Dr. Kenneth Fleischman, who is the Associate Professor in the School of Information at the at University of Texas at Austin. And he's also the founding chair of Good Systems at UT Grand Challenge, as you see behind his head. Um, and his project was the 2020 Conference on Undergraduate Informatics Education. And Ken, if you could just say, as I said, a little bit about yourself, um, what brought you to the Pitt UN movement, and just say a, a very a brief overview of what your project was. Awesome. Thank you, Effie. Um, I should mention, sorry, the website information was out of date when the program was made. So I've been promoted since to professor in the school. Very Texas at Austin, sorry. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm really delighted to get to be here with such esteemed colleagues from across uh, the uh, Pitt UN universities. So um, in the School of Information, we focus on the intersection between people, information, and technology, but we always put people first. So the our iSchool, as many other iSchools do, um, builds upon and extends a tradition of service to users that comes from our roots and continued efforts in the field of librarianship. But we now expand that to a broad range of information technologies, some of which are still contained within libraries, archives, and museums, and some of which go far beyond. So as part of that effort um, in the UT Austin School of Information, we're launching an undergraduate major in informatics. Um, we have six concentrations, cultural heritage informatics, health informatics, human-centered data science, social informatics, social justice informatics, and user experience design. And so uh, when we learned about the exciting opportunities at Pitt UN and the, the range of, of different universities and colleges, uh, all getting together around this common vision of ensuring that technology serves the public interest, it fit perfectly for our iSchool it fit really well for me. My um, background is truly interdisciplinary. So I was an undergrad CS anthropology double major. Um, and then I moved to the field of science and technology studies where I got my master's and PhD. And then I've been living in high schools ever since. Um, so uh, we were able to organize by just barely because it was March 2nd to 4th. Um, so just immediately before everything shut down, uh, informatics education 2020 in the city of Austin. Um, at the campus of the University of Texas at Austin. 
So the collaborators on the uh, project um, within the UT Austin School of Information, Amelia Acker and Eric Meyer, our Dean and also our uh, Pitt UN um, representative uh, designate and um, also from the University of Michigan School of Information because um, we were two, uh, you know, top I schools within uh, that that have that same tradition of of librarianship, but taking far beyond. And you know, so that included uh, Pat Garcia, Casey Pierce, and Kentaro Toyama from University of Michigan School of Information. So we're able to bring together faculty members and and students from thirty different universities, uh, ten of which are current Pitt UN members. 20 of which might be future Pitt UN members. And there were a lot of, actually Eric got a lot of questions because he's also chairing the membership committee about um, you know, how to get their provost or president to join Pitt UN. So it spurred a lot of interest in Pitt UN in general and it created a lot of information exchange. And then most, the last thing I'll say about it most specifically, it led to uh, a project that we're doing for the this coming year, um, which is the uh, Pitt UN Social Justice Informatics Faculty Fellows Program which is a collaboration with Houston Tillotson University, which is the oldest university in the city of Austin. It's also uh, HBCU, um, as well as with uh, Measure and Capacity Catalyst to social justice oriented nonprofits and the city of Austin, as well as UT Austin School of Information, uh, Good Systems, UT Grand Challenge. And um, we're going to have faculty fellows from across Houston Tillotson and University of Texas at Austin learning directly from and with our nonprofit and government partners about what it means to do public interest technology. Thanks. Great, thank you. I'm now gonna move on to Dr. Mahmoud Farouk, um, who is the Associate Director of the Consortium for Science, Policy and Outcomes based in Washington, DC. And he's also a clinical associate professor for the School for the Future of Innovation in Society um, at part of Arizona State University. And his project was Public Interest Technology Community Innovation Fellowship. Please, Dr. Fruit. Hello, uh, thank you, uh, Effie, for the introduction that saved me from telling who, who I am. Uh, I, my work mainly focuses on uh, two questions. One question is, how do we make science more useful? And the other one is how do we make science and technology more democratic? So it's, oh. the, it's the democratic part that brings me to Pitt UN. And uh, it's a pleasure to give a brief overview of the Public Interest Technology Community Innovation Fellowship Program that uh, we launched with the help of our grant. So this fellowship program is a partnership between ASU-led Expert and Citizen Assessment of Science and Technology, or ECAS network, and the Association for Science and Technology Centers, or ASTECs. So ECAS is a network of university science centers and nonpartisan think tanks that engages public on science and technology decision-making. ASTEC is a membership-based network of about 700 science and technology centers and museums. So our program focused on the public part of public interest technology and on boundary organizations that work to engage them in science and technology society issues. Why? Because there is a growing demand uh, placed on these institutions to be the educators, translators, conveners, facilitators, and bridge builders between the lay public and decision makers on complex social technical issues uh, from artificial intelligence to gene editing to climate change. So our, the project's goal was to create a replicable, scalable, and competitive fellowship program where museum professionals could work collaboratively with a civic government or university partner to co-create and convene a public forum on a pit issues of interest to their communities. So we selected and trained 10 fellows in five communities. So in Ann Arbor, Jade Marks at the Museum of Natural History worked with Justin Shell of Shapiro Design to create a community forum on environmental justice. In San Jose, Anya Scholz of Tech Interactive and Corinne Takara uh, worked together uh, to create a forum on ag tech, biotech, and food. In Worcester, uh, Rachel Kunby of Ecotarium and Stephanie from the city of Worcester created a forum on reducing urban heat island effect. And in Waco, Texas, Cindy Millard and Mayburn from the Mayburn Museum and Melissa Mullins created a forum on water challenges and climate resilience. Finally, at LA, uh, Sasha Burris of Discovery Cube and Rebecca Fredman from LA County Chief Sustainability Office work on sustainability education. 
Now, because of COVID-19 restrictions, our fellows had to innovate and find online tools platform combined with creative strategies to engage stakeholders and residents in their respective communities. But they all persevered and looking at what they have built in the face of widespread uncertainties, we couldn't be any more proud of them and we are thrilled with the outcomes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mahmoud. Um, next up is um, Margaret Hagen, who is the executive director of the Legal Design Lab and a lecturer in law at Stanford Institute of Design. And her project was Pitt Case Studies Platform. Yes, thanks. So <clears throat> I came to the Pitt UN movement as a lawyer and as a social scientist. I run a lab um, at the law school at Stanford where we work with legal aid groups and courts and city government to work on eviction cases or debt collection cases, family law problems. And we've always been thinking um, how to improve the citizens experience of the justice system and how to leverage technology and data and artificial intelligence to improve the services and people's outcomes when they go through court. So public interest is already a watchword inside the law school community. So it's um, been really great in terms of developing more interest in um, law schools, faculty and students about how to work more interdisciplinarily across campus to leverage all of these other fields um, on problems and policy areas that we as lawyers and people in the justice system care about. Um, the project that I've been working on within the Pitt UN network has been a website, a case study platform in partnership with Georgetown University and Tanina Rostain there at the Georgetown Law Center and Howard University and Noha Hazizi, who's an electro, um, electrical engineering professor. So we have um, student teams in all of our universities who have been scouting around within our university network and beyond to find classes that are being taught on public interest tech, um, themes or projects, and then to uh, student projects um, that have emerged out of them. And we've been drafting case studies and publishing them on the platform. You can go visit uh, our prototype site, pitcases.org. Our goal here is to really spotlight um, how a public interest technology project can best be um, launched within a class and potentially outside of it, spinning out into a new um, venture and how teachers who are thinking about taking kind of a public interest technology lens or teaching a project-based class can put together an effective syllabus, build partnerships with community organizations and teach and guide students through this process. I've taught several public interest technology style classes and there's a lot of ups and downs in actually setting up the partnerships and the curriculum. So our goal is that these case studies can both be used inside of classes so students can wrap their heads around this type of project work and um, in the planning stages for teachers as they're setting up a successful class. So you can see we have about six um, current case studies up there and we're putting more up week to week. Uh, if you have any interest in having any of your classes or projects profiled there, please, um, you, there's a link on the website to, to let us know, but we're really hungry for more examples from teachers and from student groups. Excellent. Yeah, I have a colleague actually that goes to CUNY Law and I told her when I learned about your website, I was, I was very excited and I told her because I know she's interested in public interest tech. Um, so last but not least is uh, Susan Imberman, who is a, a professor of computer science at the College of Staten Island CUNY. And actually formerly she was the Associate Dean for Technology Education at Central Office, which is actually how I first met her. Um, and she, her project that she did with um, our um, uh, our OER librarian, Ann Fiddler, is entitled Curricula Design and Public Interest Tech. Please, Susan. Thanks, Effie. Um, so uh, my project was not just done with our OER librarian. It was also done with a number of colleagues across the university. Um, Karen Shelby at Baruch University. She's an artist. Um, Deborah Sturm at College of Staten Island, who's a computer scientist, and Deborah Klatnik, who's also a computer scientist at Brooklyn College. So we started off with a small village and the premise of our project is that it takes a village to create and share curriculum. So our project was to create a repository of materials that was focused on public interest tech by awarding university-wide faculty mini grants to create and share PIC curricular as an open educational resource. 
And we were essentially crowdsourcing across the CUNY University system. The resources and curriculum that we created were sh are shared through our university repository and via pit group on OER Commons. So we created this pit group on OER Commons. It is open to the public. You're more than welcome to um, link your materials to it. And both of these repositories made the curriculum available for download to anyone who wishes to download it. We've had, um, at the current time, we have about 33 pieces of curriculum up there. When I did my original video, we had 18. So just to show you that we are you know, constantly adding material to that. And since the summer so far, we've had 507 downloads worldwide. So it's been a very interesting project and very um, widespread. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Susan. Um, so we're doing very well. So I, I have to say, I was when I viewed all of your um, your videos, your poster sessions that you did, where you spoke about your projects. One of the things that struck me, and maybe this is just my own inclination, sort of in my background as a political theorist, I'm really interested in the definitional aspect. Like we're still, I think, struggling a little bit with what is public interest tech and how what people what people's understanding of public interest tech is. Um, and, and interestingly, I don't know how many of you attended the, the president's and provost meeting today, but Anne-Marie Slaughter was saying, you know, what's wonderful, there seems to be, there does seem to be this, this common idea of what come public interest tech is, is gelling and there's the courses being led and we're, you know, creating a program or a discipline, or not a program, but a discipline. Um, and the thing that really struck me about the, these four different projects, sort of how they differed was that Kenneth and Susan's projects, although Kevin, Kenneth, you said you have a very interdisciplinary background, was that in some ways they were much more sort of grounded in the art traditional sense of like, as you know, as mentioned, one of the other panels, sort of the, the digital understanding of public, of technology. Whereas Mahmoud and Margaret's, it really seemed like they were, had much sort of a, a broader, understanding of technology that you bought to your projects and the people that were engaging with with your projects and particularly my moods i mean it, it's interesting with you working with the um the museums and the science learning centers i mean this is i guess what nsf calls um sort of uh, stem learning in informal settings and so i guess what my question is having said all of that i guess i'm just wondering of the, the 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 faculty members and the the science educators and the students that you worked with, did you get a sense of? I mean, did you sort of leave the definition of what is public interest technology up to them and let them figure it out through their work, or did you have sort of a common understanding of, um, you know? Because I mean, it's again sort of Mahmoud. It seemed like there was a very broad. I mean, the projects that you covered dealt with, you know, smarter cities to you know water usage to. I guess I'm. I'm wondering sort of how you were defining technology. <laughs> Maybe we should, we can start with you, Mahmoud. Yeah, so uh, our actually goal was to find the public interest. And I think that's what uh, uh, Larry Suskin was uh, talking about in the previous panel, which is, you know, so we actually led the communities, the, our partners to figure that out by asking the people. So they did an extensive, the first phase was, you know, the topic development. So they engage with the stakeholders and experts in their communities to say, if it's water, okay, that's what I want, but what's the issue in water I want to particularly focus on? And then they developed the program, a set of questions, and then they brought in the public for the dialogue. So that's how it was, you know, to find what's the public interest so normally, because we're coming at this from that recognizing there's a, you know, a public value failure when we fail to incorporate the public and, and what is that? And we think that the best people to answer that question is the public themselves. So, so instead of you know, us academics trying to figure it out uh, by studying lit review and, and doing all the things we do, this was a, an exploratory in that sense. Is that kind of addressed? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Margaret, do you have any thoughts on sort of what was the, the technology that you were bringing to the public interest technology? Yes. Well, I think because our project focused so explicitly on kind of courses and projects, student projects that were already out there, we were interrogating like what classes actually identify in this public interest tech sphere. And I would say the general pattern that we see in terms of courses are 
a public interest partner, meaning either a government agency or a nonprofit who is acting with a mission in the public interest, then coming to a university um, class partner and saying, how do we fix this problem? How do we kind of solve this um, gap, um, usually with the idea that technology is the solution. So as we saw more case studies come in, yes, oftentimes the, the projects that come out of these public interest tech classes are data driven or artificial intelligence or new text messaging system, but not always. Sorry, I have a kindergartner interrupting me. Can I take a break? Oh, of course. So Ken, what do you, so what, um, what sort of uh, projects and discussions came out of the conference that you had in terms of sort of, I guess, um, you know, con uh, converging on a, a definition for public interest tech? Yeah, thank you, Effie. So it was, I mean, very broad reaching. So um, we largely left it up to the participants in terms of we laid out public interest technology as we understood it from the New America website and from our involvement in the first convening. Um, but, you know, I think that we're still building uh, the whole concept of public interest technology and, and Pit UN is, is, you know, in this really exciting growth phase. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity and opening there. Um, for us in a school of information, we're an inherently interdisciplinary unit. Mm. So um, we're not a discipline. We're a wide range, I believe. Um, we're, we're rapidly expanding in the ETH Austin School of Information with the launch of the undergraduate major. So this number will be dramatically different in a few years. Um, but last time we looked at this a few years ago, we had about low 20s faculty and we had at least 10 different PhD fields across the faculty. So you won't typically find that in a CS department or an engineering department or in a core social science or humanities department. Um, so, I mean, there were, you know, uh, I would say a third of the people who attended were at Pitt UN universities who were learning about informatics in high schools. Mm. About a third were from informatics in high schools learning about Pitt UN, and a third were kind of wild cards. Um, so we had quite a mixture. And when I heard the original idea of Pitt UN and of public interest technology, it sort of struck me immediately as how much it resonated with what we're already doing in schools of information. So in some ways, I almost, my reaction is part of the reason we need public interest technology is because not every university has a school of information. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, I think that definitely there is value in each of the different concepts, but there's a lot of convergence and it would be great to see the public interest technology university network and the iSchools coordinate in terms of thinking about how the brand of interdisciplinarity and of using technology to serve people to do user-centered technology leverage data, information, and technology to, to serve the public interest. Um, and to, uh, you know, not, you know, when you just say, well, here's some problem, we'll add technology to solve it. In a lot of cases, it's going to exacerbate existing inequalities in society. In some cases, it's even gonna create new inequalities in society. And our approach is quite the opposite. We want to figure out ways that we can uh, use information technology that is people-centered, that's social justice oriented to uh, make sure that we have a more just and um, where we have, we have equity and justice and liberation in society. Great. Uh, so Susan, I noticed when I was looking at your project, I noticed that you had I mean, you funded the faculty projects that you funded were all the way from, you know, creating a module in, into from an existing course all the way to creating a whole new course and also working. One of the, the larger grants was for faculty working across uh, disciplines, you know, humanities and social science and, and um, STEM disciplines. How did what did you find in terms of how the faculty across the different disciplines approach the idea, of, you know, approach the concept of public interest tech? Um, so. Basically, we did not define public interest tech per se. What we did was we offered the various definitions, like from the Ford um, site and from New America and from the Heinz School also had a lot of good um, information exactly how you could frame it. But the bottom line was we told everybody, it's a nation field, there is no real definition, and we are the ones who are defining it yeah. as we go along. And that's why we felt that in OER was a good way to go because as we're defining this 
nation field of Pitt, we're going to um, take whatever curriculum and resources that we've already built and build upon them and share what we've done to you know, extend what has been done already. And I think that's where that there the power is, is that we're, we're still in the, in the weeds right now. We're still trying to figure out exactly what Pitt is. And um, we did a training and I kind of boiled it down to two phrases. We do good and we do no harm. And I think around those two ideas, um, we can expand upon the idea of what Pitt is. Great, thank you. So I want to encourage um, everyone um, if, for all the participants in this session, you know, please, if you have any questions, uh, share them in the chat. You can put your questions in the chat as we go along and we hope to leave um, a good amount of time at the end to get to any of your questions. And we have very able um, technical support people that are gonna be making sure that we don't lose anything. Um, so I guess one of my other questions is about, um, I know that many of you talked about sort of outcomes in your in your videos, but I'm wondering, um, actually, Mahmoud, you were very sort of explicit in terms of the outcomes that you were measuring. But I guess even in a more general sense, um, how do you um, how are you measuring the outcomes? How are you measuring the success of these? And then I guess also uh, to the extent that if you you see um, you know, what's the next step? Where do you, are you thinking about scaling up? Are you thinking about transferring to other contexts, other schools, other, um, you know, other populations in terms of outre outreach outside of the, the academy, which many of you are already doing. So um, why don't I start with you, Ken, this time? So what are you thinking about in terms of next steps for uh, this project? Uh, yes, thank you, Effie. So yes, and, and this, I mean, the collaboration that we have with uh, between UT Austin School of Information, Houston Tilson University, um, Measure Capacity Catalyst and the City of Austin emerged organically from the conference. Um, the feedback overall was extremely positive about the conference. I think a lot of people had a great experience, learned a lot, met a lot of great folks, did some good networking, saw some educational approaches that was part of in, you know, in launching our informatics major that will start accepting students for fall 2021, we wanted to make sure that our faculty were interacting with folks who had vast experience uh, teaching undergraduate students, specifically teaching undergraduate students in terms of how to leverage data information and technology to serve the public interest, which is a huge focus for our iSchool and for the informatics major. Um, so uh, that, that naturally uh, led from workshops that, uh, that we had at the conference that combined different stakeholders across the city of Austin, just seemed like in the COVID moment, a really exciting opportunity to just focus on how we could turn the city of Austin into a model of how multiple universities, multiple nonprofits and city government could collaborate together. Um, academics alone can't solve all the world's problems. Um, and I think this is uh, similar to Mahmoud's approach that we, you know, we didn't come in saying we know everything. Um, definitely, there's a whole lot that academics can learn from our community partners and from government agencies that have a much uh, richer sense of what actually can be done and needs to be done in the world. And we're much more powerful together than we would be uh, in isolation. Great, thank you. So Margaret, what about it for you in terms of just, I, mean, I know you wanna get more cases for the website, but what, what do you see sort of um, more sort of long-term would be the, the beneficial outcome from your project? Well, I think as the network, as this Pitt UN network um, really solidifies and grows, our goal is that the case studies and the resources can be integrated into it. I think, um, yeah, that the leaders of the network are also quite interested in having this rich set of content and resources, guides, examples um, uh, there as a central resource. So we're talking with um, the leadership about how we might fold in all of the materials that we've been assembling um, into their kind of central website. And also how we set up a pretty um, uh, user-friendly protocol to capture all of this knowledge that comes out of disparate classes, um, programming events. Because um, we know uh, it's really hard oftentimes in some universities to get a new Pitt 
uh, oriented project off the ground or to help a teacher who's taught in a certain way to um, all of a sudden teach this new type of class and start community partnerships, grade and evaluate these kind of projects, or even know how to support students during the class or afterwards. So our hope is that as we build more examples and more content, we can um, have very well-structured guidance for these future teachers and future students in this space. Great. Um, so Susan, what do you see in terms of, I, I know that, I mean, I also have, um, I'm a huge advocate of the OER work as well. And as you know, I've <laughs> done a lot of work with the library in terms of um, building out the op open educational resources initiatives at CUNY. But I, I'm, I'm wondering sort of how do you see, where do you see um, going forward in terms of building out your OER website? I mean, and I guess also maybe the, I don't know, like future intersections or the, con the ongoing conversation between OER and PIT, sort of where do you see that headed? So, well, going forward, um, I'm hoping to get more people to contribute to that PIT website at OER Commons. Um, be great to link some case studies up there also. Yeah. <laughs> be great. Um, plus one there. <laughs> And, um, and also in the process of getting all these faculty together to do their grants, we had trainings together. We actually formed a, a kind of community. It was a kind of a, a very holistic type of experience so that the faculty members themselves were looking and talking to each other and seeing that there were some synergistic re you know, relationships that they could um, leverage. Uh, and so I think that um, in addition to that, faculty have said to me, do you know, I, I did this, but I want to go on and extend what I've done. And um, like, so there are people who created a module for a course and that wants to revamp an entire course, or they saw that there was some interdisciplinary um, action that they can take within their institution so that they can have some type of maybe type of interdisciplinary minor created. So there's a lot of avenues that we can go along in order to extend and expand. Great, thank you. So Mahmoud, I'm wondering, I mean, as I said, you actually had very good outcomes data in your presentation, if anyone gets a chance to watch it. But I, I guess I'm, what I'm sort of curious, so I don't know if you were able to sit in on the, the presidents and provost panels today when, when um, Eric Schmidt and uh, Darren Walker from the Ford Foundation and formerly from Google spoke, but they all spoke very strongly about the importance of you know universities and universities as the platform for driving innovation and driving you know making real societal change, and I guess I'm wondering from your perspective as somebody that works uh, much more uh, closely or works much more directly with these um, um, th with the you know these community groups and these sort of public. Um, you know, science literacy groups and museum groups and public science groups, I guess I'm wondering what what do you see as like the, the, the feedback loop or the synchronicity between what universities are doing and what these, these public science organizations are doing and how can they support each other? Um, well, uh, you know, one of the, uh, when we, in, in our, uh, the, when our grant was reviewed, one of the things question that was asked of us is how are you gonna work with the other network universities? you know, because you oh, are going to work with the museums and the communities. And, and we, we did try to uh, open it up to engage with the other universities. Uh, one of the challenges that we found was more like cultural because this idea of, you know, directly engaging with the public uh, is, 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 is most universities or educators often come at this from a deficit sense, like public needs to know some information. And if they know that information, they're gonna do what we are recommending them to do. So it, it be, so there is kind of a, uh, I feel like although we, we work, the part with the working with the museums and community organizations worked very well, but I think we need to do some kind of cultural or educational exposure about what is it to actually work with the community? What is it to actually listen and not go there to say, oh, you need to know this and I have an answer because that this co-development process. So I think that, you know, the demand side of it is there. The supply side from the university, we need to do some work on 
to sort of train faculty, train postdocs, you know, in kind of how do you kind of do this bridge building engagement? That would be uh, as something that I would think would be important to do. I muted myself, sorry, right. <laughs> um, so I guess it's just like I was at a, a governance subcommittee. I, it, it, I mean, I guess some of these uh, meetings that we've uh, been in or um, panels and committees, they sort of address the COVID-19 thing, the, the quarantine thing head on. And then other times it seems like we sort of dance around at it and it's like, oh, look, we're in this virtual conference and everything is fine. And here we're all just talking to each other just like normal. But I guess I am interested, I mean, I mean, I guess in some respects, I can sort of see the very direct importance and impact of, say, OER, because that directly, you know, impacts how we teach and, and our pedagogy. And um, but I guess I would like to hear from each of you, one, how your um, project itself adapted to our greatly changed circumstances. And also, again, sort of the, the, the future question in terms of um, I don't know, responding to this and learning from it. Like, what are you gonna learn from this experience going forward in terms of how you continue to think about Pitt and continue to think about these projects? I'm gonna start with you, Mike, Margaret, cause you're shaking your head. <laughs> cause I guess you're nodding. <laughs> yeah, well, I would say in the short term, um, you know, our project is still of case studies is going full steam ahead. We didn't necessarily need that much in person to get it done. Though everything has slowed down in terms of responsiveness and people's schedules. So that's a real thing, um, the COVID related delays. I would say though at the, the bigger question, if our project is really motivated on how do we teach public interest technology and give students really good methodologies to do participatory design, technology development, ethical reviews, all of these things, it's we don't really have that many good models for doing much of this work that depends on hands-on collaborative in-person trainings in a more virtual uh, world. So we're really interested if anyone out there has models. I know in my classes, we've been trying out virtual design workshops, virtual user interviews, all of these kind of new methodologies um, where before we were really reliant on in-person convenings and all of this good participatory interactive um, kind of reckoning with uh, technology's consequences or advantages. We're losing a lot of that in the digital sphere. So now we're really hungry to do some of that initial evaluation of how some of these uh, COVID um, versions of technology and project-based classes are going and how we can start to define some best practices for those. Oh, Effie, you're muted, I think. Uh, sorry, am I, you can hear me, okay. Um, so Susan, I, you know that I'm very interested in, in OER and how it's impacting our pedagogy and how we teach and how we, you know, approach education and learning. And, and I'm wondering how you think, I mean, it seems like, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 crisis has, brought into high relief sort of the importance of the development of these OER materials. And I just wondering how, if, if at all, that you know, this period or thinking about this period has impacted how you think about your work and your project. So, um, so I, I'm going to relate this to, to, to one other project that I've done in OER and the current project. So um, one of the projects that we've done that sort of preceded the one that I'm doing for Pitt and sort of informed it was that we, as part of CUNY's um, one of the initiatives that we have with the city is that we bring industry professionals into the classroom to give a industry focused class. And part of the requirements of these industry people, these poor guys, is that we require that they share whatever materials that they use in the classroom as OER. And this way other people can see how industry is working. And um, according to my, one of my colleagues that who was watching all the um, downloads, as soon as COVID hit, the number of downloads increased significantly. Mm. We're out there looking for materials in order to use in their online classes, especially PowerPoints and um, and uh, homework assignments and lab assignments. These these were you know we were we were hungry, and and to that end, because everything you know, especially CUNY, we we had to like we flipped on a dime to online learning many of the faculty that were working on projects for me became, their workload increased exponentially. Yeah. 
it's hard to imagine that it does just by you know going online versus face to face. But when you're online, it tends the the content seems to go faster, and therefore you have to prepare more content. And it's definitely just a, a and the way that you assign homeworks and do projects definitely changes. So a lot of our faculty were a bit overwhelmed. A couple of them, you know, rescinded their awards. They said they just Aww. didn't have any time. I know. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then a lot of them just said, well, we just need some more time. We just want to hit the summer and just be able to focus on this without having to worry about the classes. And um, uh, New America was very gracious and allowed us to do an extension until December of this year. So we're, we're still not finished. So. Um, yeah, so it definitely affected us in a lot of ways, but it's definitely in terms of being useful for a community or an academic community at large, the, the OER that we already have up there was certainly utilized by many, many people. That's great. Now you know I mute myself. I have a tendency to make noises the entire time when people are talking, <laughs> which is not, it's not a good thing at Zoom because you can't have two voices at the same time. Um, so Ken, so how had how did the COVID nineteen crisis? I know that you talked a little bit about how it felt like the you know the pace of everything was speeded up, and you had to have you had the conference right before sort of the whole shutdown. But how do you see um, you know the thinking about the COVID nineteen crisis and the shutdown and all of that impacting the the work that you do with your project? Yeah, I mean to be honest, Effie, most of it was just dumb luck from the standpoint <laughs> that. We had scheduled that. I mean, the conference center had a very limited number of dates. Um, we were given options in January, February, March, and April. The April one was right before Kai in Hawaii, which didn't happen. Of course, it got completely canceled. Um, but that was the reason why we we uh, instead picked the March date. Um, we didn't have a lot of time. To be honest, part of our original thinking of um, doing it in the you know spring semester was um, avoiding the heat of you know Texas in the summer um, but then you know there became a, a very different reason why it wasn't possible to hold a conference in the summer so um, and we had um, 20 uh, fellowship winners who uh, flew in uh, courtesy of the the generous funding from Pitt UN that we were able to award um, which was um, junior faculty or students or postdocs and who were affiliated with uh, minorities, many of whom were affiliated with minority serving institutions or um, were members of groups who were underrepresented in, in Pitt. Um, so it's great to be able to have a broad representation of participation across the conference. So, I mean, it was actually made it more memorable for many of us because it became the last in-person conference that many of us will attend for a bit, um, certainly have to this point, and we didn't have to figure out how to do a virtual conference, uh, which I can appreciate as a major challenge, even pulling off an in-person conference with just a few months lead time was, was challenging enough. Um, but it, yeah, again, it made us in terms of our next steps, made us think, I think the COVID moment makes you think about what's most important and what kind of collaborations are most essential in this moment. And I think that really did for us sort of lead to this idea, let's build a citywide collaboration and um, you know, start something here in Austin, Texas, and then expand it out to the country and the world. All right. Um, well, we're we're at the point where we're almost supposed to take questions from the audience. But Mahmoud, I do want to hear from you. I'm particularly interested too. I guess working with a lot of these cultural and public institutions. I mean, that with your partner, Aztec, your partner. I mean, it seems like hasn't there been a huge crisis in terms of funding? And I mean, I'm just wondering what's how the the COVID crisis has impacted even. I don't know, the existence of some of these institutions that are your primary partners. Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, just in addition to thinking about how COVID has impacted your project. No, that, that's, that's exactly right, because it was an existential crisis. So, uh, and our, our program was uh, spread out the whole year, you know, so we just finished our training and now we are going to train them how to build a forum and they were going to do them in summer and that just, you know, obviously was not possible. And, uh, and some of, and all the museums shut down. Yeah. Some of them were, some of the people were furloughed. Luckily, you know, one, but all of our fellows made the, survived the first wave. Some of them didn't, the more recent ones. So, but what happened was that one, they wanted to keep on going. They said, we want to, so we actually kept our training schedule, the webinars, 
we just uh, pushed out the actual forum convening part to the fall. And what also happened, which is what I think was, you know, Ken talked about miracle or uh, and something like that. So was the transformation that happened? They became the innovators, come up with a very different, unique design. And some of them, I, I will encourage you to go and visit what they created. This, this was quite remarkable using synchronous, asynchronous, you know, and hybrid kind of environment. So it pushed them to actually do something more than what we originally planned for. And I feel like we have stress tested this program. So I think, you know, if things become more normal, because our, our fallback position is face-to-face -face is very important. You know, when you sit down with a person, you share a meal, you hang out together, that's very different than what you can do in online. But, you know, if we can go back to that and use some of the learning, we can make a more enhanced and uh, engaging uh, uh, opportunity for citizens and decision makers to come together and deliberate. So. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I do not see, I have a, a question sheet. Um, uh, Mark, is there other questions that are coming in from the audience uh, that we can respond to? Because we're in the question answer period. Oh, oh there's no questions so far. <laughs> You've answered all of their questions. Um, well, I mean, I, I guess um, the one, I mean, sort of the one question that I did have for both of you, I mean, we, we're gonna do, we're gonna do a little bit of a wrap up in a few minutes, but um, I guess um, I would be interested to find out for those of you that did more sort of like the, the mini grant type um, uh, or, you know, conference and mini grant type things, what were the criteria that you used to select your, the, the people that participated in your project? So Susan, what, in terms of picking the faculty in the projects, how did you, how did you choose who was going to get the grants and do this? Well, we, we looked at whether the proposals connected pit with the discipline that they were actually in. Ah. And um, in our RFP, we also requested that the faculty give us a timeline for when they were going to implement the curriculum. It was not just enough that they're going to give us the curriculum as in terms of um, a resource, but we wanted them to implement it in the classroom. And they were also required to give us a budget as to how they were going to use the funds that we gave them. And we made our decisions based on whether these three criteria made sense in terms of the proposal. Um, we also tried to make sure that we funded proposals that covered a representative cohort with respect to full-time faculty versus adjunct faculty, um, community college and senior colleges, as well as looking for a geographic diversity within New York City. Great. And Ken, I know you talked about, I was a little bit, so the, the, the conference itself, you said there were 100 participants from 30 colleges, but then there were 10 um, specific um, awardees so who who were the 10 and I know that you said that you tried to be you know select a diverse group but I'm I'm curious I wasn't entirely clear on who who the actual actual cohort of the 10 uh grant sort of mini grant recipients were uh, yes Effie I believe it was 20 although there may have oh, been okay. one or two I had to cancel due to to oh, okay. COVID but um it was either 18 or 19 of the 20 awarded were still able to make it despite the unusual pandemic pre you know it's just on the cusp of the pandemic circumstances. Um, and so the three criteria that, well, okay. So first we, um, participants submitted um, abstracts for, it could be a paper or a panel or a poster. And so we reviewed those first. We were uh, looking for um, relevance to public interest technology. We were looking for, um, relevance to the field of informatics broadly conceived, which again, at, as, at the UT Austin School of Information, our approach to, um, to informatics is very broad and interdisciplinary. So we had a lot of social scientists there. We had a lot of computer scientists there as well as folks in I schools and, and other units, um, as biologists and, and engineers and, and lawyers. So wide range of, of different folks. And, and certainly representation was one of the considerations. So our view of excellence is that it has to include broad representation as part of that. You're never gonna get the best ideas by looking at a very narrow cross section of, of, of participants and you want to have everyone's ideas at the table. You'll have much richer ideas as a result. 
Um, and then once we had done that pass, then we reviewed, we also had uh, the, uh, only some people applied for the travel uh, fellowship. So many, you know, if someone was a full professor, we had a, uh, a director of a school come and uh, so they're able to pay their own way through their, uh, their travel funds. So we prioritize to folks who wouldn't have travel funds or wouldn't have sufficient travel funds. So the three criteria that we used were prioritizing junior over senior. So we're focusing on um, students. We had undergraduate, masters, and doctoral students present and, and, and presenting. We had some fabulous undergraduates from Olin College of Engineering um, who presented at the conference, which was phenomenal. Um, it was a conference on undergraduate education, so it was great to have undergrads who are the actual consumers of the of the product there to tell us what we could be doing better and also perhaps thinking ahead to their careers as potential future uh, educators. And uh, we had postdocs and some junior faculty. And then we focused on uh, minority serving institutions. So um, we had uh, participants from uh, four HSIs and from two HBCUs. Um, and that was, you know, certainly funding is, is useful in the context that, I mean, whether you're talking about a minority serving institution or a community college that, I mean, every institution has different resources, unfortunately. So it's important that we make sure that we broad representation, even though not every institution has the same opportunities and resources. That's the benefit of the Pitt UN funding. We also wanted to make sure we had broad representation in terms of lived experience. So um, in terms of, uh, we asked people to describe uh, the extent to which um, they felt represented in, in, in PIT, in STEM, in informatics. And so certainly, uh, you know, one aspect of that is like gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, um, race or ethnicity, uh, disability status, um, first generation college student, you know, a lot of different factors, veteran status that could play into that. But we wanted to have broad representation across our society. And um, we really felt that, uh, I mean, that the, did help to really have a breadth of representation and perspectives, which led to much deeper conversations. If everyone had been from the same universities and you know dressed the same and everything, it wouldn't have been an interesting event. It was much more, uh, much richer from the, the different lived experiences, the different disciplinary perspectives, the different institution types, which really drives what undergraduate education is like at a liberal arts school compared to a polytechnic compared to an Ivy League school. So we had this broad representation. Yeah, yeah, I saw Katie. Yeah, I, I just want to add that I attended that conference and it was- Oh, I was wondering if that was you. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. I, and it was, it was plus one for that conference. It was, it was, and it was just before the, you know, basically everything hit the fan. And, uh, <laughs> and like the next week we were like, oh my God. <laughs> and it was the last in-person in conference I attended. Yeah. Well, we have just about five minutes left and um, they had asked us to give you a little time to just wrap up, say any parting comments, anything you'd like to say about the conference, about your project, about Pitt UN, about where we're going, where you've been, anything. <laughs> Why don't we start with you, Margaret? <laughs> sure, well, I think, you know, I had come to this project I thought I was very interdisciplinary um, before I kind of uh, started the case study project, um, but really it turns out I had been in my bubble of other law school professors or lab directors and had been thinking of public interest in a kind of very narrow justice um, or law oriented way of thinking and way of teaching my classes. So I really appreciated seeing how public interest tech classes are being taught in public health schools, in um, policy schools, and all kinds of other domains. And so I'd really recommend that uh, if you are teaching a class, there's a lot to learn from um, other folks' syllabi and um, coursework, how they structure their partnerships and classes. So um, I'm all for more of this kind of cross sharing and figuring out, uh, even if we are all interested in public interest tech, the unique variations that that actually takes in different policy domains. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see how we develop more of uh, great teaching methods and how we can share them really effectively with each other. I think that's a great place for Mahmoud to come in here too, because it's not only sort of radically interdisciplinary and getting out of your own bubble, but it's also those really important connections between um, 
you know, non-governmental organizations and, you know, in the public. And, and so, um, Mahmoud, do you have any pi final thoughts about you'd like to share? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, what it convinced us, first of all, the model works. You know, we brought in somebody from a uh, museum world and brought the, to work with somebody from, say, government or nonprofit or university, and they can co-create something and build that relationship, work five out of five times, you know, so they, and, and what we also saw that there's actually a great demand for this, and mm -hmm. we need to create the capacity, you know, if you look at post-election or you know, our COVID recovery and so forth. So we need to figure out how to empower these institutions which are kind of at the front line. So universities, you know, through Pitt UN, we can actually build, help build those capacity. And now that we have created a model, you know, all of us have different models, we can actually then, you know, replicate this and build a social capacity in different levels. So that will be, you know, the long-term goal here. Yeah, it's exciting. Uh, Susan, what do you think? Well, um, I always like to, to quote Katie Comiskey, who's yes. in the grantees and is the other session. Um, she put it quite succinctly, um, OER is pit. Uh, by its very nature, it is a public interest technology. She's also said, by the way, if you own a cell phone, you're a technologist. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, we, we could argue on that one, but okay. <laughs> but still, I, I think, you know, I, I think it, it's just what it's OER def, is defined by Pitt. It is a public interest technology, and it's one that we can um, utilize in our academic curriculum and our syllabi and share. And, I, and I'm just really excited to see the way that people use our um, curriculum that we've provided in addition to case studies um, and how these are revised and, and reworked into even bigger and better um, educational courses and um, curricula going forward. Great. So you've got the last word, Ken. I think so. I, I think for us, it was really exciting. I mean, part of the strength of Pitt UN as we see it is the broad range of colleges and, and universities and schools that are represented at Pitt UN. So just the, the broad representation of, of different institution types. Um, at most, like in iSchools, most iSchools tend to be in large public universities, which are great, but aren't the whole of academia. So the broad range of different, uh, different um, academic institutions that was represented and it's led to so many collaborations. So we're already thinking about what UT Austin and Houston Tolson can do together to collaborate. There's an interlocal agreement between the city of Austin and UT Austin that resulted in part from the collaborations that Good Systems UT Grand Challenge and the UT Austin High School have been involved in and bringing in. We're funding seven projects with the city of Austin um, in Good Systems UT Grand Challenge, one of which won the Metro Lab Innovation of the Month Award for July 2020. So there are a lot of opportunities for doing smart city work where it's not just about the tech, it's about how the tech can serve the public interest. Well, thank you so much, all of you. I, I learned a lot. <laughs> um, so are we, Mark, is there something that we need to do to close this out or are we good? What do we do? <laughs> We're good? Okay, well, thanks again so much, all of you. And I think there's a few more events. I hope to attend the uh, the final celebration event, but I hope to see you all again soon. And it's been a real pleasure hearing about your work. Thanks so much. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.